everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Darlene Rondo, and I'm the Vice President of Best Practices for Leonardo's Online Merchandising Group, and I'm going to be your host for today's event. I'd like to go over some housekeeping items before we begin. First, we're going to be recording today's webinar and sending you a follow-up email with a link to that recording and slides. You also have a questions dialog box in your GoToMeeting panel, and I see that some of you have already found it. And so if you'd like, you can test it out now by just sending us a quick hello and get used to that because as we move through our discussion today, we want you to send in your questions through this box and we'll address them throughout our webinar if we have time at the end, though I doubt it because this is such a jam-packed agenda, we'll address them. So we'll also be using the chat box to share links to supporting content during the webinar and we encourage you to check out these links once once we conclude the event. We're also going to be live tweeting today throughout the discussion. You can join the conversation at hashtag LeoWebinar. And now I'd like to introduce our very special guest. We're thrilled to have Jennifer Wesley, who is the Industry Director of Travel at Google with us today. Jen joined Google in 2011 and currently leads strategic relationships with hotel, air, car, vacation suppliers, and online travel businesses, a very busy woman. Prior to joining Google, Jennifer was a leader and consultant within several publicist companies where she developed marketing, communications, and e-commerce programs and platforms for Fortune 500 companies in the media and entertainment space, along with consumer products, travel, and financial services industry. And Jennifer has over 20 years of experience in digital technology and marketing, working across a range of industries and companies. She holds a BA from Duke University and a Master's in Journalism from Northwestern University. And she lives in Lincoln Park, Chicago, with her husband and two children. So thank you very much, Jen, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Darlene. So as we always do, for those of you who've been with us before, we start with a poll. And our first poll today is, uh, do you have an SEO strategy in place today? So you can choose from yes, kind of, I'm getting help from my brand, or no. And the answer to these to this poll question helps us in a couple of ways. It helps us understand where our audience is coming from, but it also helps us in development of content marketing as we move forward. So I'll let everybody weigh in, and it looks like, by and large, it's a tie between, yes, I have an SEO strategy in place, and uh, kind of, I think I'm getting help from my brand. So thanks, you guys. Really appreciate that. I'm going to launch another poll here. And this poll is, do you know what your brand is doing for you from an SEO standpoint? So again, yeah, you can choose from yes. I'm not sure. I just know they're doing something. I have no idea whatsoever. Or I'm not a branded property. So please. Uh, click the radio button that most closely resembles what, uh, what is relevant to you. And um, again, it looks like we're, we're uh, pretty much tied between yes, and I'm not sure, I just know they're doing something. So 31% are saying yes, and 40% now are saying not sure. And the rest is split between no idea or I'm not a branded property. So thank you for sharing that with us. And then one more before we continue. What areas of SEO could you improve? Now you can select one or all of these answers. So is it competitive analysis? Is it keyword research and strategy? Is it website design and content? Or is it just everything that you think you could improve on? So, wow, this would fast, like 60% of you guys say everything. So, again, thanks for sharing that with us. And we are going to continue with our program today. So, we chose to focus on search engine optimization 
because you've told us that it's a key topic that you'd like to learn more about. And as we all know, all tactics to drive traffic is valuable, but solid organic traffic that is non-paid is the most desirable for obvious reasons. You don't have to pay for it, right? So between 2015 and 2016, digital marketing agency Wolfgang Digital analyzed 87 million website sessions of travel and retail websites. And what they found was that 39% of site traffic came from organic Google searches compared to 20% from cost per click advertising. And these organic Google searches led to nearly 50% of travel brand revenues. So how do you get more of that non-paid organic traffic? Well, for this you need to understand two things. How travel shoppers behave online today and importantly moving forward how they're going to behave. And the second thing is how to optimize your website to rank higher in search engine results so that more people can find you. And to help answer and, and put some color around these questions, I'm going to hand it over to Jen Wesley now from Google who's going to share their very valuable insights on the future of marketing. So Jen, over to you. Great. Thanks, Darlene. As Darlene said in my introduction, I look after uh, most of the tra travel supplier business in the United States for Google. And in doing that, I spent a lot of time throughout the year meeting with our customers, getting insights about their challenges and how Google can help explore, um, help you explore new ways of doing business as, since we do live in a constantly changing and evolving environment. Um, so as we approach this, this conversation, Darlene asked me to share some thoughts on what's the biggest changes that are happening and what you as marketers can do about it. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about what those key changes are and then some of the product changes and opportunities that Google has been working on and bets we've been making to enable you as marketers to create and capture um, new customers and extract the most value that you can. So first of all, if you go to the next slide, Darlene, we know that uh, we've already been experienced what the future uh, that's coming to us next. Mobile has forever changed the way that we live our lives. I mean, I pretty much don't go anywhere without my pixel. And uh, I think it's been referred to as just another bod body organ, a, an extension of our hand. Um, and, and we're all painfully aware of that. In fact, you know, what we find is that 60% of our searches for travel are coming through uh, mobile devices. 20% are coming as voice searches, wow. um, which is a new and emerging trend. Um, just on that note, I wanted, you probably know, we see billions of searches every day, um, and we see many, 20% you know, or so, that are brand new. Um, in fact, you might not realize this, but one of the top rising mobile searches in the world is for something called a fidget spinner. So if you know what that is, you've probably been asked for one by a child under the age of 15. And if not, um, just to give you a sense, this is a little device that was designed to help students um, with attention disorders to improve their concentration. And they've caught a wide attention by the general population and are extremely popular. They've actually been banned by a number of schools. Um, but more importantly uh, to, to us is that search is really the first place that people turn when they want to get something done. We call these, these micro moments when you want to do something, find something, understand something new. 87% um, of smartphone owners turn to search first and that's consistent in travel decision making. Mobile is the first place that consumers go to get information about where they want to go, where they want to stay, and what they want to do when they get there. So one of our uh, major bets as a company is to make search as useful as possible. And if you're familiar with Google, you know our mission is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. Um, but in the past couple of years, we've made a, a slight pivot and a, a change to uh, what we're doing. And we're thinking, we're raised the bar beyond usefulness. In fact, we've changed our expectations of ourselves um, to go beyond just answering questions to anticipating what those questions are and we've really shifted to a mindset around assistance and what's allowed us to do this is the proliferation of smart devices. Uh, the phone was just the beginning as you know we now have devices in our home and our thermostats in our cars that are all there to make sure that our experiences are more engaging, uh, more useful, more efficient and so we've really changed the way that we think about 
how consumers interact with us and what we bring to them in real, in real time to make sure we service their needs. And all of these changes are really changing consumer expectations. What it means for you is that when consumers come to your website on desktop or mobile or they show up at your front door, they, are, they have higher expectations of what you'll deliver to them, um, whether they've asked for it or not. And the way that people are getting uh, this assistance is, is really different, as I pointed out. You know, certainly on your phone, you're all worse used to pulling up your maps and seeing different routes to get you where you need to go. Um, now we're asking, well, we're driving our car if a restaurant is open or we're asking to get a reservation. Um, so totally different interface and experiences, which really changes the game and asks marketers to think differently about how we show up for consumers across the board. Hey, uh, Jen, just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, am I on the right slide? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So let me be clear. This isn't just about how consumers use devices. Uh, we're really talking about how we develop experiences, and we have to make sure that every experience we develop is assistive to consumers. Throughout our daily life, we are looking for ways to get relevant, frictionless and useful experiences whenever and wherever we are. As consumers, we know this. As marketers, we haven't been so good at delivering it. And I'd say, you know, by and large, if I talk to 50% um, of major hoteliers in the U.S., I'd say 10% um, of them are, are meeting expectations. Um, very few are exceeding. Um, and we have, we have a long way to go. So even though it's been mobile for a long time and we've all known this and we're so in personally connected to our mobile devices, when it comes to what, what brands are doing in the mobile space, we still have a lot of work to do to improve those experiences. So let's talk about a little bit about what that would mean and, and what we're doing. So the good news is uh, that we're closer, we're closer today than we were uh, two years ago or a year ago in being able to fully harness all of the information and data that is being extracted from our mobile usage. Uh, it, it was the case two years ago even that with all, if all this activity through mobile and Internet of Things were coming through to us, we might not have been able to take full advantage of that data because it was simply too many data points and too much data. Uh, and one person's consumer journey to book a, a travel reservation includes over 400 touch points. 80% of those are on mobile devices. So very hard to get a hold of where she is, when she wants something, and what message to deliver to her. But the great news is that we have made some incredible strides in machine learning that are allowing us to take advantage of this data at scale without necessarily having to intervene as humans and make sure, and make sure we understand all of those touch points. And I am on the, the, the one billion slide. Okay, let yeah. me get there with you. Thank you. So what we're doing is we're taking all this rich intent data, which is people starting their travel searches on Google, people surfing the web for information while they're dreaming and planning and booking their vacation. Combine that with the data we have um, around users, so if you're signed in um, and we, we understand who you are, where you are, what's in your Gmail, and then combine that with incredible knowledge in machine learning so that we can take advantage of all the information that's out there and deliver assistive recommendations to consumers but also to marketers and that's probably the biggest change um, that we're seeing in the search space is the ability for marketers to let the machines do some of the work. Put in your business goals. Tell us what you want to achieve. Is it profitability? Is it number of bookings? And let us help you optimize your budgets against that using the, the data about intent, about the user and their behavior and their needs and their context, and then give you the right consumer at the right time with the right message. So Jen, um uh, Janet from the audience has a question, and I'm sure it's a question or a comment that you've heard before, and it's around privacy. So, you know, it's hard to balance how much information 
uh, should I offer in exchange for some piece of useful, uh, you know, a useful app or uh, assistance, as you called it. So, what do you tell people about balancing privacy with uh, functionality or, or uh, guidance? So, just to make sure I heard the question, uh, the question is, how do you advise consumers to protect themselves around giving data to companies or brands as they uh, make choices to interact with that brand, or is it how do I advise brands on privacy? Uh, well, it's it's not clear, so maybe answer both of those. Okay. Uh, great. Well, at Google, we believe that consumers should have all control of their data. So that means that at all times they're in control of both who they give access to their data, who they give access to, and we have the ability to take that away. Um, so there are many controls in your Google profile that you can check out that allow you to determine what advertisers have access to you, what kinds of messages they can deliver to you, and where you see those messages. Um, in addition, I'd say if it's someone who's asking to tap into your contacts or your location for an app, um, that's really an individual decision uh, based on your trust in that brand and your knowledge of their privacy policy. Um, I think we take pride at Google in how we protect people's privacy, especially because uh, it is really our, our mission uh, to, to protect our users at all costs. And so our privacy policy is extensive, and, and you could look at that, but you have to be sure that you've taken a look at that for, for other brands as well. As a marketer, our, our desire is often to use as much data as we have, and we have a ton of it. And we are very eager to help marketers use that data in the right way. So if you have first-party data, a database of your most loyal consumers, for instance, um, we are working actively to help you match that up with our users in a very safe way so that your data isn't compromised and our data isn't compromised. So we're currently doing that with many customers where we allow them to upload their audience, combine that with our audience, and go out and find people who they know or people who look like people they know that they want to attract to their property. Yeah, that, that's very helpful, and it's such a, uh, can be such a touchy subject, right? So uh, thanks for giving us some insights in that. Um, a billion photos every day, you know, that doesn't surprise me, right? Cer certainly at Leonardo, we're all about the images as well. I read a stat recently that um, more images have been, more photos have been taken in the last 24 months than have been prior to that the previous 90 years. It's crazy. I think there were more photos taken by my 13-year-old daughter than were previously <laughs> taken, yeah. taken in the last five years. So I <laughs> totally understand that. So it's, uh, our Photos app is a great example of machine learning that I think everyone on the call could probably understand. So um, I use this to represent the power of assistance. There are a billion photos uploaded every day. Uh, to Google Photos. And it's very hard for any one of us to manage our own set of photos. Um, but if you look at your Google Photos app on your desktop or on your phone, you'll see that there's something called Assistant. An Assistant will allow you to sort those photos, filter those photos, create an album, a video, or just a collage of photos entirely based on the criteria in the image. So you could pick someone's face and curate all the photos of that person. You could pick a location and quickly find all the, the, the photos you took on your recent trip to Barbados. But you could also put in something more generic, like a plant or an orchid, and find all the pictures you've ever taken that had an orchid in it. So you can see, when you, if you look at the Photos app, you'll see what the power of machine learning, even on your own small collection of photos, and, and small being in quotes, because I know we all have hundreds of photos. Um, and that's what the same technology that Google is using in its advertising algorithms today. When you use AdWords or you work with us on, on uh, YouTube campaigns, we're using that same machine learning to optimize your campaigns, to understand who your users are, and make sure we can predictively find the most valuable customers for you. Excellent. Uh, another great example of machine learning is Google Translate, uh, and I thought I would share this story. Uh, machine learning has really revolutionized the translation capabilities. Google's always had a, a great translation um, facility and, and app, um, but in the last, we've seen more improvement in the last um, year than we've seen in the last 10 years combined. In fact, our translation service has gotten so good 
that um, one researcher, a distinguished uh, researcher of Hemingway, put the snows of Kilimanjaro through Google Translate in Japanese and translated it back into English. Um, so he put it into Japanese, from English to Japanese, and then back to English. And when we had people read the first excerpt compared to the one that had been translated through Japanese and back again, um, no one could find uh, the differences that were there. They were so slight that they were almost imperceptible. Um, this is machine learning at its best. We're able to take natural language, um, conversations that we're having right now, and translate them when we're able to translate into hundreds of languages. So I, I have to tell you this true story. It just happened on Saturday relating to Google Translate. And so a friend of ours was visiting from Paris, and uh, he has an Android. And somehow he, he changed the language on his phone from French to some language I didn't recognize. And he didn't recognize. And he goes, Darlene, help me fix my phone. So I go, well, first of all, I have to know what language it is so I can know what all the icons on the phone mean, right? So immediately I go to Google Translate and I type in some of the words I see. And lo and behold, it was Estonian. And so, oh, gosh. yeah, it was hysterical, but by using Google Translate, I was then able to figure out what all of the, uh, what all the labels were on the phone so that I could change the language back to French. It was funny. That, lucky, lucky for him that you were there. It's definitely <laughs> still being Estonian. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so the question for, for you all is, what does all this change, um, the, sh the pivot to mobile, the pivot to mach artificial uh, assistance powered by machine learning, what does it mean for digital marketing? It really means that our experiences with our de devices is going only to get easier and better, and there'll be no limits to the possibilities for you to provide assistance to your users. And you'll have opportunities throughout the consumer travel journey to reach them, engage them that are far surpass anything that we've had in the past. Um, as an example of that, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time on planes and I find that when I go, even when I go over a location in the air now, if I'm on Wi-Fi, I will get a recommendation about what's below me. So it's <laughs> um, very, uh, very perceptive to where exactly where I am. Uh, but to take full advantage of all these possibilities, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, when we talk to consumers, we hear them say that they want brands that are helpful and stay one step ahead of them, but only a third of experiences are, are even close to being described this way. They want Consumers want us to find ways to stay a step ahead of them, and that requires us to really understand them and then do some predictive analysis uh, that requires innovation beyond what we've been doing. Um, data and machine learning are part of it, but it's simply not enough. We also need to become smart about how we use this data and be careful to the, to the question answered earlier about how we use it so we respectfully use it in a way that makes people's lives truly easier. And if you think about, just for a second, how much the power of context has changed marketing, um, if someone is close to a store or a hotel or even standing in it, we can now we can now tell that that's happened. So that means if someone's seen you in Google search and they've searched on their phone, but they don't click on your ad, but they show up in your store, we're able to report on that. And that's really a big change that we've been doing. We've been using um, technology to do this for some time in the retail space, and we've tracked over 500 billion visits to retail stores. Um, and we haven't used it as much in the lodging space, but something that, in the travel space, but something that is absolutely critical, especially for um, hoteliers that uh, thrive on the last minute booking where you are often seeing a booking come through on a phone or a walk-in. So uh, Jen, Katie from our audience has an interesting question. She's saying, so you're saying that most experiences are not done well. What exactly do you think consumers are looking for if we put it in the context of a hotel? Any, any uh, ideas? So I think consumers' expectations of all experiences are being defined by brands that you, you know and love as a consumer. It's Amazon. It's Uber. Um, it's Google. It's, it's Apple. So you're no longer, your experience in hotel before and after is no longer being defined by just the travel space. 
So think about what you love about, and I'll use Amazon as an example. When I go to Amazon to buy my essentials for my home, it's it's often already predicted what I'm going to, to order. It gives me recommendations. It helps me understand in a moment-to-moment -moment basis what's happening with my package. Has it arrived? When will it arrive if not? I mean, I'm constantly getting updates from them. And then after my order, I frequently get a survey, and I can see the results. And um, there, there's just a deep level of personalization. So to your question, um, I think when hotels go to think about personalization, we often think about the on-site experience. And I think most brands do really well at this. It's easy to look someone in the face and get to know them and, and make changes to your service level based on what you know. Um, what we have to work on is this digital experience that's happening before, during, and after. So today, there are 10x more touch points in the digital space than there are on property. And we spend, I'm going to make you know, a vast assumption, over 50% of my time, our time thinking about the on-site experience. And um, the truth is, of the 400 touch points in the consumer journey, we're not spending enough time thinking about even 10% of those to make sure they're frictionless, they're useful, they're personalized. Um, and, and that's kind of where the, the opportunity is for hotels. Yeah, absolutely. Bill Marriott famously said, people enter through your digital front door long before they ever step foot physically in your hotel room. So I think if you think of it in that context, that puts, a, that puts quite a, a point on it. And to answer the question you asked, you asked in the beginning, Darlene, about you know what do you need to know that's changing um, to be best in SEO? And the number one thing is this mobile experience is paramount. And so, uh, what we've learned is that the drop off of users between one and seven seconds of a mobile site is double. So we really we're not even talking about. Um, the opportunity to make improvements at a macro level, we're talking about seconds making a difference as to whether someone stays on your site on a mobile device or not. Yeah. Um, and we've made some some changes to how we rank uh, our, our listings based on how ready they are for mobile. We have a new technology system we call AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages, and publishers and brands that are using AMP as the code for their pages will load almost instantly when they're searched and we're ranking many of those publishers higher than those who are not taking advantage of this accelerated mobile technology. Are we on the right slide, Smarter with Data? Well, I'll tell you what, how about we go to um, uh, the slide with three people on it because I think we've covered a couple of, of points um, coming up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so going back to the question about how can hoteliers take advantage of all of this data and changing the experience, let's, let's think about three very different travelers. Joseph is our first traveler. He's searching on the best rates on hotels. And Joseph wants to compare the lowest prices from a trusted source. But his search term is actually pretty close to the search term of his, his two cohorts there. Um, but in our analysis, because of the rich intent data that we have, we can actually tell that he wants to compare rates. And so you'll see that the, the Priceline ad, the language of that ad, the verbiage, is different. It says compare cheap hotels and save up to 60%. Carrie is searching for the cheapest hotel. And like Joseph, she wants to book a hotel, but she's also trying to understand um, how to save the most that she can. So she's not even looking for a comparison. She just wants the cheapest. And so when her ad shows up, we're actually enabling advertisers to show exactly the right message. So in this case, we don't call it action to compare. This is just about what great prices Priceline has. And a DT like Carrie is also searching cheapest hotel, same words. But she wants to save money um, as well as, as her friend Carrie. She also is a loyalist to Priceline. And so we know because of our ability to integrate first party data from our advertisers, we also know that she's a loyalist and we're able to deliver her a specific message around that guarantee. So three people using exactly the same language or looking for this quote unquote same thing have very different intent and because we can deliver this customized ad experience, we're driving up conversion rates and increasing return on ad spend um, because we take intent, context, and identity and mix those together to make sure that we're delivering the right message at the right time. 
So here's a question, and I'll ask it, uh, I'm, uh, and it has to do with OTAs from Denise. She says, so are you suggesting that we'll get more reservations for someone like a Google versus an OTA like Booking or Expedia because of this type of uh, intelligence? What I, uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that because, of course, that has so many factors that we can't control. I think what I would say is two things. First of all, if you're advertising on Google, make sure that your brand or your business is taking full advantage of our automation and our smart bidding tools, allowing you to bid on certain people who are loyalists to your hotel, who are familiar to you, or, or people who aren't who you, because you don't want to pay for those loyalists. And then also not only determine what's most profitable for you, but then also to deliver the right creative at the right time with some of our, our um, smart tools that allow you to do that. And in this example, Priceline has done that. So they very well may get you the best reservation because they're taking advantage of all of our automation tools. They're using their first party data to find the right person. Um, just to take you through a brief history, when search started, it was a page of 10 blue links. We got much better and smarter through machine learning of delivering the right 10 links or the right three links. Um, what's really changed now is we're at such scale and we have such amazing tools in machine learning and assistive technology um, that it's no longer about put in a keyword and get 10 links. It's about Darlene searching for something that she wants to buy or do or find, and we actually know everything else about our Darlene so we can deliver her the one right link. So we're no, we're no longer going out looking for 20 links, although we very well may deliver those just in case, but we're trying to deliver the exact right one. And so that's why, um, from an advertiser standpoint, a marketing standpoint, when you go to take advantage of of our ad products, you should make sure that your ad is the exact right ad that, that Darlene wants in that moment. Targeting at its best, right? Um, okay, so a lot is going on in the background. There's millions of computations running in real time. There's auctions, multiple auctions going on to deliver the relevant ad. And I'm pretty sure that no one on this call wants to get into the details of how that works. Um, <laughs> All you really need to do is know that there are tools built into our advertiser tools that allow you to literally click a button to take advantage of the technology that Google has mastered over the last decade and to target and deliver the right ad to the right person. And LaQuinta is a great example of where we've done that um, most recently. Uh, they really changed the way that they were thinking about their search campaigns um, instead of putting in keywords and bidding on them all equally, they were able to determine which keywords were actually more profitable in the context of the full customer journey and personalize the messages as I showed you um, before. And they got more direct bookings at a higher return on investment. Uh, it more than doubled the click-through rate. And it wow. achieved a 27% higher conversion rate compared to, to new, new visitors. So we're really changing the game on their performance and we're doing that by the combination of intent, their data and our data, and machine learning applied to that data. And for those of you who are maybe still catching up on machine learning, and I'm by no means I'm an engineer, I'll give you my quick, uh, quick definition. Machine learning is just the ability to give the machine a ton of data and for allow it to learn over time what works best based on some criteria you put in. Um, and so what, where we used to go and code thousands of lines of code to teach computers a lot of rules, um, much the way um, you, know, you might have seen back in the day, you know, if then rules, uh, what we do today is we say to the machine, we want the highest profitable customer that exists, go find them, and then we pour data in them to show what other profitable customers look like or what the best conversions have looked like in the past, and it learns from what's happening in real time. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that explanation. I think that was helpful to a lot of folks. Great. So where are we now? Let's see. Incorporating data into your campaigns is critical, so we've got that. Um, but once you capture a consumer and you know that uh, they're interested, the next step is equally as important, and this is the place where I see that most hoteliers have a way to go, and that is that we simply have to get the fundamental right, uh, fundamentals right when they come to our mobile site or our mobile app. Um, 
consumers will only tolerate something that can be done in one step or one second. Um, I used to work in the food and beverage space, and I love to use this example, although I know it's not totally relevant to hoteliers. I think there's something for us to learn. I worked with Domino's Pizza. Um, this was three or four years ago, and they decided then that they would always be the first to market with one-click ordering. So any new device, any North new capability that came out, they had promised themselves that at an organization level they would be the first. And you can now order a pizza on Google Home, and you can customize your toppings. You can also order a pizza with an emoji. So they've taken <laughs> it to a whole other level. But I think the lesson is and something that they learned early on because pizza ordering was very common on mobile and, and much more of a conversion, common conversion than, than in hotels. Um, it has to be one step, it has to be one second, it has to be simple. Um, it's good to know that OTAs have 60% of their bookings coming through mobile. I'm sorry, 40% are coming through mobile. 60% of our searches, 40% of their conversions are coming through mobile. The supplier side, 20%. And we attribute a lot of that to the experience just not being as seamless for consumers. Um, we also did an analysis of our 900,000 mobile ads landing pages, so the landing pages from an ad, and we found that people would um, bounce twice as likely to bounce between one second and seven seconds. So that means for every second that your site delays loading, your conversions fall by 20%. So on mobile, it's pretty simple. Speed equals revenue. And uh, I'd say when we test our clients, and I work again with you know many different hoteliers, we find that on a 4G network, they're doing okay. It might be three seconds, might be four. Um, unfortunately, the whole world doesn't operate on a 4G network. And so um, if you're testing your website in your property or in your corporate office and it has great Wi-Fi, try, try turning down the Wi-Fi, going to a slightly downgraded uh, bandwidth system so you can make sure that everyone's having that same experience. That's a good point. Um, and the other thing that we're doing, and we talked about this, is, is related to mobile web pages. So we've, we've launched something called AMP. We've, we've had more than 2 billion AMP pages that have been published to Google Search. 35 million are being added weekly. And so these pages load from under, under a second on Google Search. Wow. Uh, advertisers like Johnson & Johnson and many others have already taken advantage. I'm sure some of your brands have taken advantage of that. Um, but this is absolutely critical to think about speed of your app and also your mobile web because you probably know from your own experience people have on average 400 apps on their phone. They're using only two or three of those on a daily, weekly basis. Okay, am I going too fast? Can we keep going? No, keep going. Uh, Non-line assistance is where the slide is at. So is that... Yes. So uh, in addition to just being speedy and simple when it comes to someone coming to your website, um, the reality is that consumers want to interact with a brand on digital even more than they do in your store, in, in the hotel, or off property, in property. Um, they don't really see a line between interacting with you here or at the desk or in the room. We make these lines because it makes it easier for us to handle, but um, the customer is the channel. Uh, the brand might think it owns certain channels, a property owns different channels, uh, a meta owns different channels, but the truth is the consumer sees these as all one, and they fluidly and liquid and move through them in a very liquid way, um, and seamlessly um, they move through it, and they don't necessarily connect the dots between what's, what's property, what's brand. Um, and that puts a lot of onus on us as marketers to develop experiences that don't have a tie to any one channel. Um, we see this a lot in retail. 70% of smartphone users who bought something in a store first went to their device for information related to that purchase, even if it wasn't a high consideration purchase. And many go to their device while they're in store looking at that same item. So we're constantly looking for um, ways to connect the dots between your channel. Um, I, I spoke a little bit about store visits. I think this is a highly under leveraged possibility for many properties. We should be, a we, we are able and we're not fully taking advantage of the ability to track your calls as well as your in-store visits. So if someone has searched your hotel and shows up at the desk, we can track 
that conversion and count it towards your search ad campaign and we can understand that. We've done that in retail and we're starting to do it with some um, hoteliers. We recently so, Jen, uh, can you just clarify, you saying that you can track if someone searched your hotel through to a walk-in reservation, is that what you said? Yes, because we would be able to tell geolocation and we can fence that into a pretty tight radius so we'd know they were in the hotel. Um, and that's uh, connective tissue for a lot of brands we're finding and um, makes it really hard for digital marketers on the brand side because uh, today they're typically only counting conversions that are happening on, on their website. They're not counting the conversion that happens on the, on, on the phone or the one that happens on site. We're, we're thinking a lot about how we connect the dots more on that front um, and, and we'll hopefully be coming out in the next six to 12 months with some, some new ideas there. Um, we're also able to do that on YouTube. So we recently announced that you can put location extensions onto YouTube campaigns and actually see did someone who watched a YouTube video show up at my location. This is particularly interesting to larger properties and, and leisure as well. Excellent. Um, I'm going to skip to the slide um, with Virgin, if that's okay, just in the interest sure. of time. Really. Um, Virgin Holidays is, is one company that's taken advantage of this capability, and they discovered that when it takes offline sales into account and to get an accurate view of how its performance budgets are, are delivering, search generates double the profit compared to when it only measured those online KPIs. Um, hmm. Driving customers to purchase on site from paid search is three times more profitable than an online conversion, in fact. Wow. So not only are we not even counting these, they're even more profitable. So here we are. These are new realities um, that we're talking about. Mobile, we've been talking about it for years. We've all had one in our hands, but we're really at a tipping point for what's possible in mobile. And much of that is because of our ability to track identity with signed in usage. Google has seven apps with over a billion users. And that, and we were recently able to tie our privacy policies together so that we can see people seamlessly um, across those different properties. So that's one reality that's new. Um, the second reality that's new is consumer expectations. They aren't going to change. You're being measured against Uber and Amazon, like it or not. And the third is that it's more than complex than ever to measure uh, conversions. And for, for as long as I can remember, we've been talking to hoteliers about last click conversion, who gets the, who counts for, gets the count for this. Um, and it's just too complex a consumer journey for us to sti stick to this very narrow view of what a conversion is. And those new realities require us to kind of rethink things. And so if I had to say what those three things were, I would say we have to rethink how you organize your team around the customer. This customer first marketing, not mobile first, customer first. How you organized your marketing and data to apply to your marketing strategy. Even if it's a small CRM database, it should be applied because when you combine that with Google data, you can open up a whole new set of of data. We can take the data you have, model that, and go find people like those people that you have that you've already found to be extremely profitable. And lastly, uh, we need to rethink how we measure the impact of media, search and other types of digital media, but search in particular. Um, if we can do these things and really rethink these strategies in the face of new realities, um, we'll be prepared for the future in marketing, the future in travel, and the future consumer. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to a, such a vast group and happy to take a few questions if we have time, Darlene. Thanks, Jen. Uh, super, super informative. And just judging by a lot of the questions that we didn't get a chance to, uh, to tee up yet, um, just a lot of interest from the audience on what you're talking about. So thanks again. Uh, the insights from Google are always very, very valuable. So uh, now that we have a glimpse into the future, or in fact the present, uh, you know, the future is just around the corner, let's look at how to get your website ranking higher. I know a bunch of you on the call today have asked for uh, uh, suggestions on how to rank higher. 
in the search engine results pages to get in front of people. So we're going to talk about that now. So remember that Google's job as a search engine is to really try and match the best content to the user's search query. And this is trending more towards long tail queries or long tail keywords. And um, a, a, French a French company, RF, analyzed 1.4 billion keywords and they found that over 85% of all search queries in the US use search terms that comprise of three or more words. So these are long tail keywords, three, four, or five words. And it tends to be very specific in nature. So for an example, kid-friendly Miami hotel near the zoo. Very targeted and quite descriptive of what that person's looking for. And because it is, it's more likely to drive more qualified traffic to your website. So that is people who are further down the booking path and closer to making a reservation. And so focusing on these uh, long tail keywords is a smart strategy because the long tail keywords have been found to convert um, two and a half times better than head terms like Miami hotels or hotels in Chicago. Head terms which are simply popular keywords that are very competitive. So uh, as I just said, Miami hotels would be an example of a head term. The OTAs and the hotel chains are already focused on head terms. So to be frank, they are more likely to rank for those terms than you are. So I would suggest you're better off focusing your efforts elsewhere and long tail keywords are where I would suggest you go with that. So according to uh, another digital company, Hittail, pages optimized for long tail keywords actually move up in search rankings by 11 positions on average compared to generic terms which move up by just five positions. So for those of you who are asking those kinds of questions, pay attention to this stuff here. So how do you identify which long tail keywords to target? Well first you have to have a clear understanding of what your hotel offers and who your guest is. So if you attract mainly business travelers, you want to focus on keywords that will resonate with them like Sydney hotel with small meeting rooms or a Toronto hotel with dry cleaning and you know certainly uh, the more you understand your guests and what they're looking for the more you can develop copy that you can write in that will uh, speak to that and as a result uh, improve your rankings in the search engine results pages so it's important that we remember and Jen said this a couple of times, you know, looking at it through the consumer's perspective. These are human beings that are coming to these websites, right? Not, not, um, not robots. Robots are not, at least yet, aren't staying at your property. So targeting the right keyword is only part of a good SEO strategy. And so for your web website to rank higher, it's important to provide content that's original, relevant, and useful because being helpful to the consumer will endear them to you. If you're a branded hotel, it's important to write your own web copy and not copy and paste what's already written about your property on your brand website. It really should capture your unique story. This is your opportunity. And as I said, it should be written for humans. Google's website crawlers are far more sophisticated than they were, uh, as Jen uh, described. And you know they're going to notice if you're just stuffing keywords into your web copy. So you want your website to read naturally, offer other elements on the page that really match targeted keywords, for example, relating to images or videos. Another important factor for SEO, as Jen referred to as well, is the speed page and overall user experience of your website. Your website's design and navigation should really follow a logical pattern that uses UI uh, best practices, so user interface best practices. And it, it, this seems obvious, but it really should be easy to know where to click and how to get that information and then how to actually make a reservation with prominent calls to action. So uh, we also just heard from Jennifer who uh, really emphasized the importance and impact of mobile, certainly more important than ever. 
As many of you are aware, and as we've talked about in great detail this year, Google's planning on switching to a mobile-first uh, index at some point. Initially thought to be this year, but I think it's looking more like 2018. But let me explain what a mobile-first experience in indexing means. Google gathers information from every public website available on the internet and puts it into a giant index. And then that index is used to return the most relevant search results to a particular query. In the past, Google would crawl and collect information from desktop websites. And now, Google is going to gather this information from mobile websites first, even if that search is done on the desktop. Mobile first means mobile first, but it doesn't mean that the desktop is going to stop ranking. So Google wants to roll out the initiative in a way that actually doesn't hurt non-mobile friendly sites. So if you have a responsive website, you're pretty much good to go because the content on mobile is essentially the same on both mobile and desktop. So stay tuned for more news about where Google is going with that. So what does all this mean? Well, absolutely, uh, if it's not clear to you by now, you need a mobile website. And I'm not talking just about a website that renders on a mobile device. I'm talking about something that is specifically built for a mobile device or a responsive website, right? So Google looks for the following elements in a mobile-friendly website content that renders properly on the screen without having to pinch, scroll, or zoom. Uh, you need to avoid flash, which is not compatible on mobile devices. Leave behind those intrusive pop-ups between Google's search results page and your web page. We've said a couple of times already, speed does matter. Finally, links should be separated far enough apart to enable easy tapping. You'd be surprised at the number of hoteliers that I've talked to who have never pulled up their own property on a mobile device to see how quickly it loads, how easy it is to view room types, how to get to the booking engine, and importantly, how easy is it to actually complete that booking transaction? And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, you can also run a test with Google to see how mobile friendly your current website is. And we're going to post a link to that um, capability in the chat box for you. So I hope I've been able to provide a few practical tips for you on the SEO front. Now I want to touch on just five important elements of your hotel website to help you convert more of the traffic that's going to be coming your way. So the first thing to remember is to tell your story your way. This is the one thing that you can do that the OTAs cannot do. And remember that your hotel website is actually your digital front door. It's a place that people come to for more information about your property to determine if it checks all of the right boxes and to drive more bookings. Your website should really distinguish what makes your hotel better than any other in your concept. I saw a question come in the chat box earlier and they're saying that uh, they're a new property, new branded property, and there are hotels that have been there for 40 years, and you know they already have the consumer uh, mind share. I would suggest that this is a really good way to cut through that competition. Tell your story your way. Describe what is different. What kind of experience is this consumer going to have if they stay with you versus the hotel that's been there for a long time across the street? Do it with visual storytelling because as humans, we love stories. We connect with stories and we remember them. And stories conjure up memories. But more importantly, they also help us develop an emotional connection. And that's important because emotion has been found to have a huge impact on, on purchase intent. So tell your unique story on your website. Be authentic. Be genuine. Tell travelers how you're going to make their experience more efficient, more memorable, or more enjoyable. Next, lead with your guest rooms. We analyzed more than 500 pieces of media to find that guest rooms are the number one most viewed image by a long shot. In fact, twice as, twice as often viewed as the next category, which is restaurants. So unless your building is of historical importance, please don't lead with the exterior shot of your hotel on your homepage. Travel shoppers simply don't care. In fact, exteriors are number nine in the top ten list. 
provide social proof. And as consumers move down the shopping path, they start to look for snippets of social proof. And they are looking for proof that generally is generated by someone else, reviews, ratings, awards, that, and it tells people something about your property. It's powerfully persuasive. 53% of travelers won't even book a hotel without reading reviews, and 76% are going to spend more and pay more for a hotel with better reviews. And so when you embed the elements uh, of social proof, like a TripAdvisor widget directly on your website, you're also keeping the travel shoppers on your website so that they're not going to go searching elsewhere for them. And believe me, they're going to look for those reviews. Now, this may be all well and good for shortlisting your hotel in the minds of travel shoppers, but a uh, final nudge may be a special offer. So be sure that you provide these special offers on your website and then reward travelers for booking direct. A special offer, and this is important, doesn't have to be focused on price. It can be other things. It can be early check-in, faster Wi-Fi, uh, first pick of the best rooms. It can be a lot of things. You see, people buy, most people buy on value. They don't buy on price. If they only buy on price, then everyone would stay in the $59 a night hotel, and they don't. So people are looking for value, and you can present them with this by virtue of a special offer. So we've certainly talked about uh, mobile a lot. Uh, it's not just important for SEO, but it also helps driving direct bookings. And last year, one in five reservations were made on a mobile device. As you heard Jen said, only 20% of all hotel bookings are being made on mobile, so there's an awfully long way to go to, uh, to drive that up and get those direct bookings via mobile devices. So they need to have a good mobile uh, experience, a clear call to action, an integrated booking engine, click-to-call functionality, <clears throat> because if you're in your car driving along the highway, uh, not everybody wants to try and make a reservation on the phone, right? It's not only really dangerous, but uh, just a quick click-to-call functionality uh, will be helpful. And as Jen said, and, and I learned uh, something new today, is that you can actually tie searching for a hotel to that walk-in. So, um, you know, again, another reason why connecting those two things is important. Clearly, Google Map integration is important, and what to see and do in the area. In the, in the list of the top 10 pieces of media that we analyzed, number three was what to see and do in the area. So it's important that you include that as well. So let's summarize quickly what we covered today. So. Uh, Jen talked uh, a lot about mobile, the importance, the importance of uh, photos and, and what Google's doing to make that, um, make searching for photos easier using uh, machine learning. And uh, one of the things that stuck out to me was her guidance about, you know, be helpful provide useful experiences, be likable, be entertaining, all of the things that we would say about all of the other um, technologies that we use that Jen referred to, you know, Google, Uber, Amazon, etc. So I think those were um, some really important things. Um, using uh, long tail keywords because they're less competitive and they will drive. Uh, they'll drive less traffic, but that traffic's going to be more qualified, and because it's more qualified, it's going to convert at a higher rate. Understand who's staying at your hotel, and use these free online tools to help identify long-tail keyword opportunities. And then, clearly, ensure that your website is mobile optimized. And to convert more traffic on your site, to get more of those direct bookings, tell your story your way, lead with guest rooms, provide social proof, include special offers, and lastly, uh, enable those mobile bookings. So if all the things we mentioned on today's webinar sound a little overwhelming, then Visley is here to help. 
We have a digital marketing solution called Visly that includes a conversion-driven website, a mobile website, professional SEO services, Facebook suite of apps, and digital brochures for third-party websites all rolled into an affordable solution. So we can help you drive more qualified traffic to your hotel website and then convert them once they, once they get there. Your subscription comes with the Visly success team, including a success coach, a content strategist, and an SEO expert. So together they will build out an SEO strategy to your hotel or for your unique to your hotel that will drive qualified traffic. And we'll do all the heavy lifting for you, including that keyword research, competitive analysis, writing the web content, building out your website, and ongoing monitoring of your SEO performance. So today, more than 3,000 hotels are using Visly to drive more direct bookings. So thanks for, um, thanks for joining us today. One last poll before uh, I let you go. And we'd like to know what you thought of today's experience. And we asked that in the form of, based on today's experience, will you attend another Leonardo webinar? So for sure, don't know, unlikely. And it helps us understand, uh, should we continue to do more of the same? Do we need to change it up? Do we need to focus on different topics? So your feedback is really important to us and we take it very seriously and use it to continue to deliver content that makes sense for you guys. So we are going to, as many of you have asked, share a recording of the webinar that you can share with your colleagues or listen to again. Uh, don't forget to visit our blog for more useful tips around SEO. And stay tuned for details coming to your inbox soon about our next webinar. So um, again, we appreciate you being with us today. Jennifer Wesley from Google, super uh, insights, really, really helpful. We appreciate your time and your effort and uh, spending an hour with us. So thanks very much, Jennifer Wesley. And uh, thanks again to all of you. We will see you next time. Have a great rest of your week. And uh, stay tuned for more details coming up on our next event. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.